If you have problems in your life and you're praying for a breakthrough, please examine your heart and ask yourself if there's anybody that you're mad at. Mercy doesn't mean that you never confront. Jesus confronted. He confronted people. He confronted issues, but he still loved the people. You have to learn to not expect everybody in your life to be perfect. Because you know what? None of us are. In John 2, 24 and 25, there's a scripture that has meant a lot to me in my walk with God and especially in trying to learn how to deal with people. You know, we have over 900 employees in our ministry around the world. And when you're dealing with 900 people, there's always somebody that's doing something that you wish they weren't doing. If you're dealing with three people, there's usually somebody doing something you wish that they weren't doing. Sometimes if you're only dealing with one person, there's somebody doing something. <laughs> How many of you agree that getting along with people and staying in peace and staying in love and staying out of anger is something you just got to work at? We all agree about that. So, we all need this message. But Jesus, for his part, verse 24, did not trust himself to them. He's talking about his disciples because he knew all men. Now, it doesn't say he didn't trust them. It says he didn't trust himself to them. And what I get out of that is he did not just throw his heart wide open to them and just say, you guys are my best buddies, and we're going to hang out together, and I can tell you anything and trust you, and you're never going to hurt me, and you're never going to disappoint me. You're my perfect friends that I've been looking for all my life. He didn't do that. Why? Because he knew all men. Verse 25, and he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. He needed no evidence from anyone about men, for he himself knew what was in human nature. I love that. You know, I think if you can just start a new job and just have a little chat with yourself before you go and say, you know what, this job's not going to be perfect. My boss's not going to be perfect. I'm not going to work with perfect people. And I'm not perfect. So I think I'll just go in every day and have a merciful attitude. See, you need to set your mind and keep it set. It's so helpful to us if we don't have wrong expectations. Because when you have a wrong expectation, then you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of pain and agony. Well, you're the last person in the world that I would have ever thought would have hurt me. <laughs> well, see, you had a wrong expectation. Because if you hang out with anybody long enough, you're going to find something about them that you don't like. Anybody can stand anything for a short period of time. But when you've got that day after day after day after day after day after day after day. Come on. I think that's why Peter said, Lord, how many times? <laughs> and this is my own personal opinion, but I believe that Peter had a problem with John. Because I know Peter's personality. I'm not writing a new chapter in the Bible, but listen, I know Peter's personality, and I know when John said, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves, I can tell you right now that that grated on Peter. And I can just see when John would just <laughs> lean on Jesus at dinner and say, I'm the one he loves. I bet Peter just wanted to knock his lights out. Now, that's just my opinion, but... I mean, these disciples were together for three years, day and night. Of course they had issues with one another. The, lo the more you're around somebody, the more you're going to see their flaws. That's why you have to start praying for and working with the Holy Spirit to develop an attitude of mercy toward people's failures. The disciples were a mess. And Jesus constantly forgave them. They argued over which of them was the greatest. <laughs> they fell asleep when Jesus needed them to pray one hour. <laughs> Peter denied Jesus three times. And yet, 
Jesus gave him mercy. On resurrection morning, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Peter's the only one he mentioned by name. Go and tell my disciples, oh yeah, and tell Peter too. I'm not mad at him. He's still in the group. <laughs> Even though he denied me three times. You know why? You know why Jesus was not mad at those disciples? Because mercy understands the why behind the what. Legalism only looks at what people do, but God looks beyond what we do to why we do it, and that's why he can be so patient and long-suffering with us and work with us toward our healing. God put up with a lot of stuff off of me for a long time because he knew how I'd been raised and he knew how I had been treated and he knew that I had a good heart toward him, but I just had a problem with strongholds in my flesh because of being mistreated. Jesus understood that the disciples had fear. Peter had fear. He was afraid of man. They were afraid. Mercy sees the why behind the what. You know, Jesus is confrontational, and yet he's merciful. Because one of the worst things that you can do is have a heart full of unforgiveness. It messes up your prayer life. It messes up your fellowship with God. It messes up your anointing. It opens the door for the devil in your life. It makes you physically sick. And what, if you have problems in your life, and you're praying for a breakthrough, please examine your heart and ask yourself if there's anybody that you're mad at. The Bible says when you bring your gift to the altar, if your brother has ought against you, you lay your gift at the altar before you try to offer it to God, and you first go and make peace with your brother. Then you come back and offer a gift. I don't think that we should be worshiping God with anger in our heart. I don't think that's real worship. And I remember standing in the front row when Dave and I were in the church that we went to for so many years where our ministry started, and I wasn't really in much of any kind of ministry yet. I was just teaching some home Bible studies. And I mean, we'd argue going to church. You know, if the devil can get anything started in your life, it'll be when you're trying to get ready to go hear the word because he'd rather that you just be in turmoil inside so you can't get anything out of it and sit there and wear your church face and smile at everybody and hallelujah, praise the Lord, and, you know, while inside you're seeing. And I can actually remember, and I had no idea then what I was doing, but I understand it now. I can remember standing next to Dave in church with my big praise the Lord smile on looking at the words on the overhead, mouthing those words, and singing the songs with my hands in the air, thinking if he thinks I'm going to cook him anything to eat today, he has got another thing coming. As far as I'm concerned, he can starve. He's just going to go home and watch another football game, and I'm going to do nothing but do all the work and clean the house, and I am sick and tired of the way I'm treated around here. And it's the hidden man of the heart that God's concerned about, not a show that we put on, but the hidden man of the heart. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us. Stop worrying about somebody taking advantage of you and just start obeying God. Let him be your vindicator. Let him deal with your enemies. God is our vindicator. But if we keep trying to take care of ourselves, then he can't take care of us. Come on, are you mad at your boss? Are you mad at that person at office that got the promotion that you felt like you deserved? <laughs> are you still mad at your parents and now they're in their 80s and you still won't call them or go see them because they didn't treat you right when you were growing up? Hmm. Don't make me come out there. <laughs> Let's look at a few characteristics of a merciful attitude just to see if we have one or not. Now, there is a gift of mercy, and I don't have it. <laughs> I do, however, have the gift of correction.
The gift of mercy can be a beautiful thing, but then you just, I mean, you just, you're just oozing with it. Well, you know, I had to learn it. I have to put it on. And I usually have to put it on a few times a day. And I'm telling you that because I want you to know that just because you're not especially gifted that way, that doesn't let you out of the responsibility of learning how to develop and work with the Holy Spirit to have a merciful attitude. We are to put on Christ. Put on the nature of Christ. And just because you were hurt in your childhood, and just because you have fear that people will mistreat you, that doesn't, cannot become an excuse to not develop those beautiful attitudes that Christ wants us to to develop. Now, a merciful person does not expose people's faults for no good reason. I'm telling you what, bad news travels through the body of Christ like wildfire. We don't even need the media. I mean, if some preacher in podunk nowhere does something, I mean, everybody's going to know it within a week. But good news doesn't spread that fast. And it's a wicked, evil thing that God despises. First of all, we shouldn't even believe a bad report except out of the mouth when we hear it from two or three reliable witnesses. And secondly, we don't know the whole story. And third, the Bible says love always believes the best of every person. I certainly know I've had some real lies told about me that just absolutely were not true. And I appreciated the friends and partners of our ministry who said, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Why are we so quick to believe the bad thing and so anxious to tell it to someone else. It's a wicked thing that's in the flesh and we need to not go with the flesh. We need to go with the Spirit and always do what God would have us do. Amen? So, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, love covers. <laughs> I love that. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up contention, but love covers all transgressions. You know, Joseph did a beautiful thing. It shows his character. When he finally was going to deal with his brothers and reveal to them who he was, there were several other people in the room when they came to Joseph to get food. And I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but he made everybody else leave the room before he dealt with this thing with his brothers. You know why? He didn't want anybody else to think badly of them. That's a beautiful attitude. Okay, now I want us to go to Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. And I pray that as we share these next few verses, that this will put just a little bit of the fear of God in us. Because I do believe that we need to have more reverential fear and awe of God. I think that's one of the things that will move a person to do what's right, even though they don't feel like it. And I can tell you that I think it's one of the things that's missing in many Christians' lives. We've gotten almost too familiar with God. You don't want to ever be afraid of God in a wrong way. But you need to know that God is God and He means what He says. And if He says He'll bless you, He'll bless you. But if He says you better not do something, then you better not do something. Because if you do, there's going to be a result. Everything that's written is here is written for our edification. This is not just a little book of nice stories that somebody decided to write down. These things are for our instruction and our edification. Let us learn something here. Genesis 9, 18. And the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan, born later. And these are the three sons of Noah... And from them the whole earth was overspread and stocked with inhabitants. And Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard and he drank the wine and he got drunk. And he was uncovered and laying naked in his tent. Now, Noah's been on this boat a long time. I guess he felt it was time for a party. <laughs> he grew some grapes, made some wine, 
drank more than he should have. He apparently got really drunk because he took his clothes off and was naked in his tent. <laughs> Just to make sure you're with me. <laughs> now watch this. And Ham, the father of Canaan, glanced at and saw the nakedness of his father and ran and told his two brothers, you won't believe what dad's doing. He is dog drunk and laying in there with not a stitch of clothes on. So Shem and Japheth took a garment, this is so beautiful, laid it upon the shoulders of both of them and went backwards into the tent Backwards so they didn't look at their father's nakedness and shame him and shame themselves. And they covered his nakedness. That's another way of saying they covered his fault. Now watch. When Noah woke up from his wine and he knew the thing which his youngest son had done, done he exclaimed, Cursed be Canaan. He shall be the servant of servants to his brethren. But he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So, how much plainer can this get? Now, yes, I know it's Old Testament, but, you know, the Old Testament doesn't go away in the New what happens in the New Testament. I, I think people are mixed up about grace. Grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy, sinful life and get by with it. What grace is, is the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what God asks us to do with ease because it's not us doing it by the work of our flesh, but it's us calling God to come and be our partner and do the thing through us by His strength and power. Don't ever think that grace is just, you know, well, you know, grace, grace, well, grace, grace. Hey, look, I'm, I'm big on grace. I love grace. But I get a little concerned sometimes when people think that means they can just do whatever they want to. And you know, well, we live under the new covenant, and that's grace. Grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy, sinful life and think that God's going to overlook it. Grace is the power to get on your knees and say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to live without unforgiveness. I want to live without bitterness. And I cannot do it on my own. But God, if you will give me your grace, if you will give me your mercy, then I can be gracious and merciful to other people. But only, God, if you will help me. And I'm not going to live angry. I'm not going to live mad. I'm not going to live bitter. I'm not going to live resentful. You said I can put on mercy, and by your power, I will put on mercy. Amen? Another thing the Bible says in Matthew 18 is if you have something between you and your brother, if your brother's offended you, first, everybody say first. first. First, you go to your brother privately. It never says if somebody offends you, you go ask 14 people what they think about it. <laughs> you go first to your brother privately and you try to straighten it out between you and him. Then it says if he won't listen, you take two or three others. If he still won't listen, then you take it to the church. There's an order of how to do things. The Bible's never saying that you just let people get by with all kinds of bad behavior. That's not what forgiveness is. Now let me close this message tonight with Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and then I'm going to pray for you. Brethren, if any person, any person, even a person you don't like, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, <laughs> that's us, right? <laughs> who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, that's what it means to be spiritual, should set him right, restore and reinstate him. Now, we don't have any problem with the set him right part. <laughs> yeah, I'm into that, Lord, set, set him right. But then it says, you restore him, and that means restoring him. In how you look at him, restoring him. Reinstate him, and I love this, and do it without any sense of superiority. And with all gentleness. Keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you also should be tempted. So one of the best things to do when somebody does something just really goofy that hurts you. 
Instead of getting all mad and having a fit and trying to make them pay for it and shutting them out of your life for several days. You can be the bigger person and say, you know what, I don't want us to have any problems. Listen, I've done a lot of goofy things myself in my life. I understand. You know, a lot of times people hurt us and they don't even know they did it. They're just having a rough day, a bad day, and they don't even really understand what they're doing. My daughter was in a line one day at a drugstore waiting to get a prescription, and the clerk was just acting like a jerk. I mean, just grouchy, cranky, snippy, snotty. And so she's thinking on her way up there, when I get up there, if she talks to me like that, I am going to tell her that I am going to get the manager, and I am, and I am, and I am. And then God reminded her that she carries my books around in her car to give to people <laughs> that are having problems. And God told her, get out of line, give up your place in line, go out to your car, get her a book, and handle the situation a different way. You don't know what's going on in her life. Maybe her husband just left her. Maybe she had a child that just died. You have no idea what's going on in her life that's making her act that way. See, mercy looks for the why behind the what. And so she, went, she said, you know, when she finally got up there again, she said, you know, I can tell that you're having a rough day. And she said, I just want you to know that God loves you. And my mom wrote this book, and I'd just like to give it to you because I think maybe it will encourage you. You know what? I think there's a better way that we can handle our conflicts, don't you? Hmm? Don't you? Okay, this won't be fun, but I'm going to do it. How many of you... You already know where I'm going, don't you? You're thinking, oh, no, lady, I don't want to stand up and have everybody in here know that I'm mad. <laughs> well, you know what? The Bible says, confess your faults to one another that you might be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. If you need to forgive somebody, if you're angry at somebody, if you've been angry a long time, if you just got angry today, if you're an angry person, if you're a quick-tempered person, if you're a legalistic, hard-hearted person, and you've heard this message tonight, I mean really heard it, and you want to have a new beginning, would you stand up and let me pray for you, please? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just so you know, this would be the same no matter where I was at. And there is something that I'd like you to do, not to be nosy, but I want you to just take a quick glance around and see how many people are standing. And I'll tell you why I want you to do that. Now look at me and I'm going to tell you something. This is why we don't have any power in the church. Every single one of us have to start taking responsibility to be that representative of Christ that he wants us to be so he can get his job done. Amen. Amen. Every single one of us. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person here would have a new beginning. Lord, I believe they've heard your word, but I know that they cannot go home and do this if you don't help them, and they need to know that. They cannot do it just because they decide to do it. They're going to have to study. They're going to have to pray. They're going to have to put on mercy and put on mercy and put on mercy until they're comfortable with it. I rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. I rebuke that demon of strife. I rebuke all that bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness and anger. And I pray, Lord, that we would want more than anything to be like you. Well, you know, the more time we spend around people, the more opportunity there is for them to hurt us or for their flaws to become apparent. We need to learn how to develop an attitude of mercy toward people's failures, keeping in mind that we will need that same mercy at some other time in our own life. We really want to have great relationships, and the way to do that is to be quick to forgive.
I've just been wondering lately, what is it that makes a person want to leave the comfort and monotony of home to come someplace crazy like this and do a medical clinic? Well, let's ask the volunteer doctors and nurses who do it all the time. They look sad and get downhearted, and then they look at you, get make eye contact, and you smile, and they read that smile, and then they start smiling, and then the kids all run to you and they smile. When you really experience that, you just you would you're hooked. <laughs> So what do you think? It can't hurt to at least check it out, right? All you need to do is go to our website, JoyceMeyer.org. All the information is there for you. And just think, your adventure may begin today. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner.